Good morning, and uh, welcome to another study. Uh, we're going to pick up where we left off, though. Um, I think we need to look at the fig tree right away. But anyway, let's begin with a word of prayer. <laughs> Dear Father in heaven, we are very grateful for this morning. We ask for your spirit's presence here as we open your word together. We ask, Lord, that you can guide and direct us, uh, that as we live in this world, in the present condition that it's in, that we can be a blessing to those around us. Help us, Lord, to, to understand your truth, give us clear and understanding hearts, and help us in our day-to-day -day walk with you in our personal study and contemplation. Be with us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we were discussing at the end of the last study um, how we were to understand these uh, uh, four trees. What, what do they represent? Now, in the Spirit of Prophecy, where we've been reading, Ellen White just says a little bit about it. <clears throat> um, she says, in a most fitting and beautiful parable, he presented before them the folly and injustice of their course. He represented the trees as seeking to make one of their number king over them. But the olive refused to leave its oil, the fig tree its fruit, and the vine tree its wine. The worthless bramble, bramble, however, readily appropriated the honor and at once stated the condition of its accept conditions of its acceptance. If in truth ye anoint me king over you, then come and put your trust in my shadow. And if not, let fire come out of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. Um, the unselfish and uh, unambitious conduct of Gideon and his sons was then forcibly portrayed. And also the ingratitude of the Shechemites. Jotham then concluded in words which proved to be a prophecy, if he then have dealt truly and sincerely with Jerob Jerubbaal, which is Gideon, and with his house this day, then rejoice ye in Abimelech, and let him also rejoice in you. But if not, let fire come out from Abimelech and devour the men of Shechem in the house of Milo, and let fire come out from the men of Shechem, from the house of Milo, and devour Abimelech. Okay, so, so we have this parable, and we're trying to understand it, and We've, we've put forward a few different theories. I mean, one is that this parable represents a past history that is a little more distant um, so that it could include, um, you know, Moses, Joshua, the judges, and then finally here, uh, um, Abimelech, right? We could have it include... Um, just the period of the judges from 2001 to 2023, or we could have it just represent the events of the story of, of Gideon itself. That is, um, these different trees would represent different aspects of, of, of Gideon's ministry, where these opportunities to become ruler are set aside and we see now under Abimelech that we have this uh, ambitious selfish uh, king the first king of Israel so so one of the things of course is the characteristics of these different trees and how would we then line these characteristics up with these different histories and um, so, I mean, the olive tree, if we look at the olive tree, we can see this connection to, um, to the sanctuary, right? Uh, we would see that from Zechariah chapter 4, uh, where you have these two olive trees. And, of course, we know that this represents the Holy Spirit, but it's also connected to this symbol of the sanctuary, uh, to the lampstands. Um. Now, as far as the fig tree is concerned, 
Uh, we didn't really do a study on this, but there are some interesting things about the fig tree and the vine. So we have the olive bean mentioned first, and then we have the fig tree and the vine. And um, you'll look at some of these verses. So as, as a fig tree, uh, the first time it is mentioned in the Bible, just the word, the, the phrase fig tree, is in Judges 9.10 and 9.11. But the fig tree saith unto them. So you've got this introduced here in Judges 9, verse 10 and 11. Now the next time you see uh, the fig tree mentioned, and you're going to see it usually connected with the vine. So... Um, in 1 Kings 4.25, and Judah and Israel go out safely, every man under his vine and under his fig tree. Um, <clears throat> from Dan even to Beersheba, all the days of Solomon. Now, does anybody remember this Dan to Beersheba uh, study that Jeff had done? I recall it. Okay. So you would call it, do you remember really what it was about? It's quite a while back. Okay. So if we just look up Dan even to Beersheba, well, we'll just type in Dan and Beersheba. Now, of course, what is Beersheba? The well of the oath. Okay. And, um, and then Dan, of course, is a judge. Correct. Now, Dan, of course, is in the north and Beersheba is in the south. So this would, this is sort of an idiomatic expression to refer to all of Israel. Right. Uh, all of northern Israel. Um, it's an all-inclusive idiom. Yes. Right. And, and most of the times you see it, it's going to be Dan to Beersheba. Um. But it's going to be in Second Chronicles chapter 30. So this is where they're going to have this second Passover. So okay. Jeff had noted that, that it was in reverse. So they established a decree to make a proclamation throughout all Israel from Beersheba, even to Dan, that they should keep the Passover unto the Lord God of Israel at Jerusalem. For they had not done of it, uh, done it of a long time in such sort as it was written. So, so Jeff had noted this Beersheba to Dan. It's also in uh, 1 Chronicles um, 21.2. And David said to Joab and the rulers of the people, go number Israel from Beersheba even to Dan and bring the number of them to me that I may know, know it. And um, the only other place where we have it not quite in the same expression is Amos 8, 14, that they swear by the sin of Samaria and say, thy God, O Dan, liveth, and the manner of Beersheba liveth, even they shall fall and never rise up again. So, I mean, we're not reading the context here, but um, so this is a rejection. The sin of Samaria, we know what that is. Idolatry. So, um, so we have this Dan and Beersheba mentioned, and often it's mentioned in connection with the fig tree and the vine. So, in uh, when you have the fig tree, um, as we read there, every man under his vine and every man under his fig tree. Judah and Israel dwelt safely, every man under his vine and under his fig tree, from Dan even to Beersheba, all the days of Solomon. So you'll, you'll start to see that this fig tree, every time it's mentioned, or not every time, but almost every time, it's mentioned in connection with the vine. So in 2 Kings 18.31, I guess I should click on these. Um, Hearken not to Hezekiah, for thus saith the king of Assyria, Make an agreement with me by a present and come out to me. And then ye eat every man, eat ye every man under of his own vine and every one of his fig tree, and drink ye every one of the waters of his cistern. So I mean, this is under Hezekiah, and this is just the king of Assyria saying that, you know, if you if you pay tribute, this is the protection racket thing. Um 
then you'll, you'll be safe, right? Um, now, it does talk in Proverbs about the fig tree eating the fruit thereof, so that he waiteth on his master shall be, he keepeth, whoso keepeth the fig tree shall eat the fruit thereof. This means to tend it and to keep it. Um, and that's in Proverbs. And then in the Song of Songs, uh, the fig tree putteth forth her green figs, and the vines with the tender grape give a good smell. Uh, so you can see often vine and fig trees are mentioned together, Isaiah 34, 4. And all the host of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heaven shall be rolled together as a scroll, and all their hosts shall fall down as the leaf falleth off from the vine, and as a falling fig from the fig tree. Um, Isaiah 36, 16. Hearken not to Hezekiah, for thus saith the king of Assyria, make an agreement with me by a present. So that's just going to be the same thing that was mentioned in 2 Kings. And then Jeremiah 8.13, I will surely consume them, saith the Lord. There shall be no grapes on the vine, nor figs on the fig tree, and the leaf shall fade, and the things I have given them shall pass away from them. Hosea 9.10, um, I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. I saw your fathers as the first ripe in the fig tree at her first time. But they went to Baal Peor and separated themselves unto their shame. And Joel 1, verse 7, um, he hath laid my vine waste and barked my fig tree. And Joel 1, verse 12, the vine is dried up and the fig tree languisheth and the pomegranate tree and the palm tree also and the apple tree, even all the trees of the field. Uh, Joel 2, 22, be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring, for the tree beareth her fruit. And the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. And then we have Micah 4.4. 4. But they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and none shall make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken it. And Habakkuk 3.17. Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines. The labor of the olive shall fail. And the field shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. So we can see one thing is that the fig tree and these trees, all these things represent prosperity, bearing the fruit. Uh, um, Haggai 2.19 is the seed yet in the barn, yea, as yet the vine and the fig tree and the pomegranate and the olive tree hath not brought forth from this day will I bless you. Um, so you got in Zechariah 3, 10, in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, so you call every man his neighbor under his vine and under his fig tree. So again, you have that same expression in Zechariah. Now in Matthew 21, so this is um, uh, now this story, of course, when Jesus curses the fig tree. Now we know that the fig tree here then represents God's people. Right, as a symbol. We're familiar with what Ellen White says about it. Um, but Jesus also says in 2121. So what's 2121? Midnight doubled. Okay, it's midnight doubled, right? So so this would have to apply to this symbol of midnight. Verily I say unto you, if ye have faith and doubt not, ye shall not only do that which is done to the fig tree, but also if ye shall say unto this mountain, be ye removed and be cast into the sea, it shall be done. Right? So this is um, when Jesus had cursed the fig tree. Right? So he says, let no fruit grow on thee henceforth from forever. Or the henceforth forever and pres presently the fifth tree fig tree withered away so what would this um now here he's going to say all things whatsoever ye ask in prayer believing ye shall receive so here we have the fig tree withering away and the fig tree is representing israel and that what was done to this fig tree that is that he cursed it and it withered away 
he's now going to equate with whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. So what is what is this about? I mean, we know the story, and, and it's also in other place um, where it... Um, Uh, where, where we address this. So, but in this context here, when Jesus curses the fig tree, why does he curse the fig tree in the first place? Is he not recognizing that Israel has proved fruitless? Right. So they have leaves, but no figs. So <clears throat> the question that I have in this situation, the descriptive that we have here of fig tree, mm -hmm. is that in the masculine or is that in the feminine in the Hebrew? Well, OK, so going back to fig tree. I don't know if fig tree is masculine or feminine. I'd have to look it up. I'll just hang on. Well, so in Judges, I'm going to look up this fig tree here. To go to my other Hebrew source. Okay. What's well, masculine? Are there not two versions of this word? Uh, what do you mean? Well, <clears throat> we're dealing with Hebrew 8384. Yeah, so there's just one word there. Well, yeah. we're both using Esau, and I'm looking at this, and it says, Te'ana or Te'ana, the second form being singul singular and feminine. Yeah, well, this in Judges 9 10, it's masculine. Okay. And it's interesting in the way that, that this is being presented because that same word, Hebrew 8384, occurs first in Genesis 3 7. Okay. So in giving a, <clears throat> a point to what, what you're addressing here from, from what the Savior had to say, in Genesis 3, 7, Adam and Eve came together and they sewed together fig leaves as a covering. Yeah, this is actually feminine in Judges 9, 10. So I was looking at the word tree. Um, and the word tree is ha'etzim, which means the tree. And then it says uh, uh, latena. So that means just to the fig, the tree to the fig. So right. the fig here is feminine. Uh, okay. the, tree, the tree is masculine. Right. So <clears throat> here in this, in this description with the fig, we have the feminine word. Mm -hmm. So is this then a further representation of the church and the movement? That 
in order to fulfill the commission given by the Savior, we need to be very fruitful. We need to understand what we are presenting and to be able to present it clearly so that others may be able to make use of these presentations not only for their own edification, but for the edification of those around them. Okay. Well, I, I just never make that much out of something being masculine or feminine, but I, you know, because in Hebrew, I, I don't think that you can just take just because something's feminine it means anything. Other than if you have something like in the book of Daniel, chapter eight, where you have this, this switch between masculine and feminine all the time, showing that one is paganism and one is papalism, that would be different. Well, but, but you know, it's anyway. In, in addressing what we're, what we're dealing with here, we are aware that this is a prophecy, right? But we already know that it's representing the church, right? So, so when Jesus curses the fig tree, I mean, we know the fig tree is Israel. Um, okay, but what, what we looked at initially, <clears throat> here is the olive. Why should the olive leave its fatness? Why should the olive leave its oil? Why, when we are tying this with the olive trees in the sanctuary, we have applied this as being a representation of the Holy Spirit. And specifically, the Holy Spirit in our experience, because if we're going to look at this as steps in the sanctuary, we need to see where this lines out with justification, sanctification, judgment, and glorification. Now, here we have the, the, the fig tree. The fig tree is presented. The fig is a fruit. I mean, I believe, if, if, I'm, not, if I'm not mistaken, the, the fig is actually an inverted flower. I don't know. I don't know anything about figs. So... <clears throat> We're dealing with a, a fruit that was well-known within the Mediterranean, well-known to the hearers, and its representation is that in order to be a producing tree <clears throat> it had to not only have great leaves for covering but also had to produce great fruit now <clears throat> here's Jotham he is making it clear in this parable that the oil was not part of this ceremony with Abimelech. At least it was not ordained as part of it. And the fruit of Abimelech is not sweet. The fruit of Abimelech is something that would be considered as very bitter. <clears throat> so <clears throat> he's asking those of Shechem he's asking those of Israel is this the kind of fruit that you really want is this is this what you want to represent
I mean, I found it, I found it interesting. The, uh, the paragraph that, that occurred before those that you read earlier mm -hmm. stated the following. When Jotham was informed of this, of Abimelech being appointed as king, he immediately repaired to Shechem, burning with a sense of the horrible injustice and cruelty heaped upon his family. He determined at all hazards to present it before the people in its true light. While the multitude were engaged in festivities in honor of their king, celebrating the occasion with hilarious mirth and sensual gratification, <clears throat> Jotham ascended Mount Gerizim to a position where he could be seen and heard by all the people and addressed them in words of keen reproof. So not only was he heard, they knew full well who it was that was addressing them. They knew directly that this was the final remaining son of Gideon. Mm -hmm. Now, how does this situation relate to the movement today? Well, my understanding is that... Um that Jotham is going to represent the 70th week. And this is a message that has to be given to this movement when it's in this um, rebellion. Right? And that message really has to deal with what, what I understand is April 5th, 2030. What that means as regard in regard to the lines because it speaks both to Odilio's line and to Colin's line to their chronological information and so that that prophecy ends up being a rebuke to the movement that's the way that I understand it but then we're going to have this parable that's going to um, be tied to Jotham, right? So Jotham is now going to give this parable. And the parable is a prophecy, right? right? So and we've already really given that prophecy, whether everyone has fully heard it or not. I don't, and that's the one thing I don't know, what it would mean to go up on Mount Gerizim. Um, so I would sort of take this as being future. But it's going to go back on the past, which is what our studies have been. So we've been looking at um, uh, from 2001, from 9-11 uh, till 2023. And so this message has to get to the movement. Somehow, you know, we have to stand up on Mount Gerizim and speak to the pe people of Shechem. Could the four trees be four stages, four stages of the movement or something? Well, yeah, that's sort of what I'm saying. From 2001, that is, there's something that is, and, and see, this is, so we've looked at the apostasies that have happened in the movement since 2001, right? That is, we've looked at these messages that have come and, and judges have been raised up to answer those messages. But it, it could be either that uh, this this um, this parable relates specifically to just the message of Gideon to July 18th itself as not accepting this kingship, right? So that is, we could look at what has happened is an unfolded with the message of July 18th. Um, that this movement hasn't taken the, the July 18th message and misused it in that sense. So, so that's what I'm trying to understand exactly where we place this, because this could specifically refer to uh, the olive, the fig, and the, the vine as something to do with the message of July 18th 
and events connected with this message. Or it could refer, it should, it could go back further. And that's what I don't know. But it, it has something to do with this movement, this parable. And, and Jotham gives this parable. And so this parable would be have to be something that's understandable for this movement. That is, whatever this parable specifically means, it's something that is given or proclaimed to this movement as a rebuke and it becomes a prophecy about what's going to happen to the movement if it trusts in the bramble <clears throat> and so exactly what this is i would say that the bramble represents a message i don't think you know obviously people are tied to a message but you know we're not we're not saying that some person is abimelech but there is a message that is parallel to that of abimelech and that would be the message regarding uh, Trump and the pandemic and the Sunday law. The, the, you know, the Sunday law pandemic idea and the Trump becoming president again idea. Okay, now, in this situation, as, as we've been looking at it, uh -huh. we've had the olive, we've had the fig, and now we have the vine. Yeah, and, and well, the fig we hadn't really finished off. Okay. Uh, Right. So you're going to have that story in Mark again with the fig tree. And it's a little bit different in how it, it unfolds. Okay. Um, so, I mean, I don't know whether we need to look at it. Uh, Why don't we? Okay. Well, so let's look at that in Mark chapter 11. So here um, it says, and on the morrow, when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry and seen a fig tree afar off having leaves. He came. If haply he might find anything thereon, and when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the fig time of figs was not yet. And Jesus answered and said unto it, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. Then he's going to cleanse the temple. And then when he comes back out, so it just gives us a little more context, uh, because the other one, it doesn't really show this, that, you know, he's coming and then going. So, um and then when they, they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. That's in verse 20. I guess I should show you the verses. Uh, you can't see them. And Peter calling to remember oh. the master, behold, the fig tree which thou cursedest is withered away. And Jesus answering saith unto them, have faith in God. For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be removed and be thou cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart. He shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore, I say unto you, what things soever ye desire when ye pray, believe that ye receive them and ye shall have them. Right. So again, he's going to address this as part of prayer. Um, and then when we look at it in. I don't know. Yeah, so, so these are the two places we have this same story. And then in Luke, you're going to have the parable of the fig tree. And that's going to be the one. So this one's important to look at. <clears throat> um, the parable of the bar bar barren fig tree. So here we can clearly see how this relates. And he spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. And he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of his vine vineyard, Behold, these three years I came, come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down, why cumbereth it the ground? And he answered and said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also till I shall dig about it and dung it. 
And if it bear fruit, well, and if not, then after that, thou shalt cut it down. So, I mean, we can see clearly what this would mean. First, you have three years, and then you have a fourth year, correct? Yes. So this is a 3-1 combination. We also know, of course, that this vineyard, this is God's vineyard, right? And now this is, of course, it says it's a vineyard, which we would normally think of as, as for, you know, grapes, but it, it just means a place, like it's a fruit place, and it's a fig tree planted in his vineyard. Um, so, so this is God's vineyard, but he has a fig tree. And so this fig tree would represent his church, correct? Represent the church. I would think that that's a, yes, a proper. Yeah. Looking at it. Yeah. But, but we can see, of course, we could apply it to this movement as well. So, because we, we have the three years, don't we? November 9th, 2019, July 18, 2020, December 25th, 2021. Right. And then we have another year that's given. Right. So this is a, a symbol of something. The fourth. The next generation. Right. The next. the That other opportunity. So we have. Uh, a close of probation, the cutting down of the tree if it doesn't bear fruit. So we, we can relate that then to this story in Judges. And then um, and in Luke 21, um, this is, good, of course, the lesson of the fig, fig tree is going to be about... Um, uh, the signs of the times, right? Um, he spake unto them a parable, Behold the fig tree and all the trees. When they now shoot forth, ye see and know of your own selves that summer is now nigh at hand. So likewise ye, when ye see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Uh, verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. So this is the, the parable of the fig tree. And, and we also know in John, the fig tree uh, is in connection with Philip and Nathaniel, right? So Nathaniel's going to be under this fig tree. Right. And, and, and he's going to be, uh, Philip is going to call him. Right. And then, Nathanael said unto him, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip saith unto him, come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him, he saith of him, behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. Nathanael saith unto him, whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Now, here being under the fig tree, what, what is it that, that Nathaniel is doing. We know this partly from the spirit of prophecy. Is he not studying? But he's studying, right? So to be under the fig tree here is, is also to study. That's the way that I understand it. I, I can't remember exactly how where that is or whatever, but I just know that it's something I've known for 40 years regarding uh, the this story. All right. So, so to me, we see all of these different symbols. We also have in Revelation 6.13, when the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs. And she is shaking the mighty wind. So figs, uh, when we were in um, the School of Prophets in 2016, uh, Stephen, do you remember what happened to the trees? Uh, this was uh, during the time of the storm. 
yeah, we had that storm. Now that storm is really significant. Um, now the storm occurred, was it on the Thursday or the Friday that the storm happened? I'm trying to remember. Do you remember the details of that storm, Stephen? I can't remember the exact date. Okay, so, so do you know who was meeting in, uh, uh, in uh, Little Rock on that day? So that's how I know the day of the storm. Um, um, I'm not sure, was it Clinton? Yeah, so, um, so 2016, and it was, so this storm, I'm trying to remember, so, yeah, so, this was July, so it was just before my, um, so I did a presentation on, um, the book of Ezekiel, on Ezekiel uh, and the 391 years and its connection to um, the prophecy of, so that was the prophecy of Josiah and its connection to the 391 years in uh, Josiah Lich's understanding of Revelation 9. So I presented that on the Sabbath. So I'm just trying to go back here to find the exact date. Um, that this happened. So, yeah, the Friday was the 15th, and it was on the Sabbath, July 16th, that I did my presentation. A week later, Heidi was anointed and healed. Um, so this storm, um, I'm reading an article here. Uh, so... So I don't know, you know, I know this is significant, but I don't know all the significant aspects of it. So, um, so this is an article from July 15th. So the storm must have happened on the Thursday. It must have happened. Yeah, so Thursday. So it says, tornado sirens suddenly blared at a graduation ceremony for the Presidential Leadership Scholars Program in Little Rock on Thursday. No chances were taken for the luminaries attending, former Presidents George W. Bush and Bill Clinton, as well as former British Prime Minister Tony Blair. The one-time world leaders were rushed to the lowest level of Little Rock Central High School, according to reports. The Associated Press said that other attendees were also moved to the level, to that level, but that Bush, Clinton, and Blair took shelter in a separate area. And your weather is interesting, Blair said Friday during a lecture at Clinton's presidential library, according to the Associated Press. We in England have the odd gust of wind, but that was quite something last night. Um, the leaders and graduation attendees adhered to severe weather safety best practices, seeking shelter in the lowest level of a strong building, given the imminent threat of either a tornado or destructive winds. Um, although there was no confirmed tornado, Adams Field Airport, a little in Little Rock reported a gust, a wind gust of 68 miles per hour, which set a new July record for the city, surpassed the previous record of 57 miles per hour um, from July 27, 1960, and marks the strongest gust of in Little Rock since August 7, 2011. Severe storms with damaging winds raked the corridor from eastern Oklahoma through central Arkansas into northern Louisiana on Thursday. Um, now, they had a description of what caused this, what type of storm this was. I can't remember what they called it. Now, the significance here um, is what? What is the significance prophetically? I mean, can we, can, so the context here is um, we are in Arkansas. So the, the importance of this is that I wouldn't have ended up presenting on the 16th, on, on the Sabbath, uh, because it was actually Daniel from Brazil, he was supposed to present. But because the power went out, so the power went out there for, um, uh, for a day or so, 
I think our power came back Friday, uh, but it was out for some places for up to three weeks. And um, so we had power, but Lambert Church did not. So normally we would have the service service at Lambert Church, and and it was actually planned to have uh, an anointing uh, ceremony on that day, on the 16th. And um, I can't remember if the baptism was planned for that day or if it just was moved later, but, I, I, but uh, there was also a baptism that happened on the 23rd uh, that was going to be uh, uh, William Pitt was baptized. And there was also an anointing service that was moved so brian was going to be anointed on the 16th but because his anointing was delayed heidi ended up he convinced heidi to get anointed and she was then anointed on the 23rd so a number of things wouldn't have happened heidi wouldn't have been anointed um if the storm hadn't occurred and also um i wouldn't have ended up preaching that sermon on the 16th so heidi wouldn't have been anointed on the 16th or the 23rd, and I wouldn't have presented on the 16th, which was significant what was presented. And um, also there was some other internal things happening at the school that that storm was instrumental in, in doing some work um, upon people's hearts. But the reason I bring it up is what happened to the fig trees there, uh, Stephen, do you remember? Yeah, I think they were uh, bent over. Yeah, they they took quite a beating. Some of them were just broken right off. Um, it's because we had this little orchard, and there was some fig trees there, some pomegranates, and and other fruit. Um, but yeah, the fig trees took quite a beating. So, so anyway, bring that up in, in this context because we have these world leaders who are also huddled in this building during this storm, uh, which I didn't know about at the time, right? But that's, uh, uh, when, I, when I searched up to try to find the time of the storm, that story of the world leaders came up uh, back when I first looked that up. So it's still there. But um, how would we tie this then to, to this movement? This, this fig tree, what does that mean? Was that a, some sort of message to the movement or am I reading into it too much? I know it's a lot of, lot of details there. Read Daniel 11 maybe, or Daniel 11, but attention yeah. Daniel 11. So Daniel 11, what, what, which, what specifically are you talking about? The storm there in Daniel 11, the, the whirlwind? Um, what, what are you? Well, the, um, the presidents, the leaders. Okay, okay. So the presidents are the leaders. Okay. And we have these ex, two ex presidents, well, I guess three, because one from the UK and two from the US. So you have Clinton and Clinton Bush and um, Tony Blair, right? Is that what we read? Yeah. Um, now the yeah. fact that this was in Little Rock, um, which is not that far from uh, the School of the Prophets. I mean, it's a I don't know hour and a half drive or two hour drive. I'm not sure how far it is uh, from the airport there. <laughs> But we, we have definitely a significant event in this movement as far as it relates to the message of July 18th, right? So can we attach the fig tree then in Judges chapter 9? Can we attach this symbol to something in the movement? I mean, because if this was a message to the movement, 
uh, the fig trees being uh, torn down by this wind, would that be some symbol, some message to the movement? And notice it's, you know, the fig tree, its response is on Judges 9-11. whether that's significant or not. But that's when the fig tree responds, Judges 9-11. Now we know in at 9-11, the church is passed by, right? But would this be the movement of 9-11? Or do we have some other way in which we can understand this? Can we take this fig tree and apply it to this movement? I know it's a lot of things to think about. So remember when we were looking at um, uh, these these various judges. So you're going to have Othniel. What was Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar symbols of? Do we remember how we understood that? Well, of course, we placed them as messages. Yeah, we placed them as messages starting at 9-11. Right. And they were going to be messages related to the need of the Holy Spirit, right? right. Often specifically. Because it was a reawakening within the movement of exactly what the movement needed to be able to go forward. Right. So we can see that 9-11, so if, if we're going to take this here, we, we, we still put Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar all kind of connected to 9-11, right? I mean, they're, you know, more specifically, we, we, we put different years but they're still all tied to that 9-11 period from 9-11 to 2014. That's how we had done it. I don't know if people remember. But, but we can put the olive tree there, right? So that's the start of this movement. Okay. Now, Deborah and Barak, um, what's the difference here with Deborah and Barak over those first three judges? So what, what was it that we saw was different here? Because we know that this is the enemy here is now going to be an internal enemy, Sisera, in a sense, an internal enemy. That is an enemy that has... Uh, that's the papacy come and come into this movement, right? Through Parminder. He's, he's being deceptive. Right. Okay. So he has, um, so Sisera is going to represent uh, Parminder's message. Right. Um, now, it's interesting, too, because in Chapter 3, you're going to have Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar, right? Shamgar is going to be me mentioned, but it's going to be in Chapter 4. It's going to say, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord when Ehud was dead, right? So, so we know that Shamgar 
though he's one of the judges, he's going to be dealing in a different territory. That is, he's going to be, um, because this is Moab, this is going to be uh, Ehud's in uh, the east, Shamgar, he's going to kill 600 Philistines with an ox goat. And he also delivered Israel. But yet, it's going to follow when Ehud is dead that you're going to have this story of Jabin, king of Canaan, which is the papacy, but the captain of his host, which is Sisera. That's the message of Parminder that comes into this movement. So we, we dealt with the 20 years and what that represents and how we fit this into this movement. Right? We took the 20 years and we took the 20 months and we fit this all in to show uh, where Parminder's message was. And we also dealt with Zebulun and Naphtali as symbols. We also dealt with uh, Heber the Kenite. And the message here is the message of July 18th or the message of chronology more specifically, dealing with the 2520. So so if we were going to, to take this, this message, so if we're going to take, and then we have the Song of Deborah and Brack, and then we have the Midian, right? So that's going to be Gideon dealing with the Midianites. So now we're here, and we're going to have this parable. And can we put the olive tree to the period of, of, of the first three judges? Can we take the fig tree and apply it to the period from 2014 onward? And, and then uh, the message of the vine would be the message, well, let's say 2014, I guess, to 2018. And the message of the vine uh, relating to the message of July 18th itself. So that's going to be Gideon's message. And then the bramble as the message after July 18th. Could we do that? It's, it seems to line up at this point. Okay. And that you was said the, you said the bramble. The bramble was, uh, what that's, was that again? Well, that's what we have right now with after July 18th, the message of Trump and uh, the pandemic. Okay. Vaccine. It seems to line up okay. at this point. Are, are people sort of satisfied with that general outline? <clears throat> I think I am. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to have to mull this one a bit. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I understand because we're all mulling it. Um Yep. You know, and then and we we can take this message. So very specifically. So if I look at this message since 9-11, we have a message. The first message from 9-11 is this message um, of the Holy Spirit. Right. I mean, from the Holy Spirit, it's the sprinkling, the early sprinkling of the latter rain that Jeff talks about. It's this, this increase of light that happens under the second angel's message arriving. And then we're going to have this first period. It's going to be marked at the end um, because we know that uh, we're going to have in 2014, we're going to, we're going to sort of have an, the end of that period. We now have introduced um, chronology into the movement at the same time that we have this first separation in the movement occurring, right? So we have these, this group that leaves, all these different ministries that leave in 2014. And now in connection with that, we also have the rise of this period we could call the period of the fig tree. So we're going to have um, this movement much more established. We have the school of the prophets, um, being set up, right? We have the first camp meeting in Arkansas. 
even though it's not at the School of the Prophets, it's at Lambert, but it's the first one that he's had in Arkansas, other than one he had a lot of years earlier um, that was just happened to be, I think it was in, I um, can't remember the name of the place. Like, um, it's had something to do with like oxygen. I can't remember the name of the place. Ozone. Ozone, okay, yeah. Ozone, Arkansas. So he had some some meetings there at one time, but uh, that was early on. So, but once they he's established in Arkansas, they have this this first time they have this camp meeting on June twenty second. So Jeff notes this um, because that was three years to the day from when he was given the hundred and sixty five thousand dollars to start the school of the prophets. Um, and then we have. Uh, so we have chronology entered into this movement. The, the movement is much more established. You have the School of the Prophets. At the School of the Prophets, these fig trees are going to be taken away by this wind. Right? At the same time, we have this message coming in specifically with Ezekiel and, and, and Revelation 9. So that's going to lead to the foundation for giving the message of July 18th. Those are two... Uh, the two prophecies specifically uh, revelation nine and Ezekiel four verse four to six that are going to be used to give us the date, July 18th. Right. But now we're going to move over to the, to the vine, right? So the vine is going to represent that period of time of the message of July 18th. So the foundation has been laid there with the fig tree period, chronology, all the things that are built up. But in this whole period of time, did you say the vine, did you say the vine, has chronology uh, would represent chronology too? Well, yeah, but it specifically represents July 18th because that's going to represent the period of Gideon, which we have marked as July 18th period, right? It's the message yeah. of July 18th, which doesn't come until 2018. So there's from 2014 to 2018, we have chronology being developed in the movement, but we don't have a date we don't have july 18th even though that symbol is already tied into uh because even back in 2015 i had the july 18th date i mean i had july 18 even earlier as a symbol but it, it just keeps coming showing up more and more till finally it becomes the date that we use to predict an event right that's going to bring about the end of the, these three trees, right? But even in the end of that, God is still our leader, right? We're recognizing that God has been leading the movement. He's been our king. Without him as our king, we don't have this light. We don't have the, we don't have the Holy Spirit. We don't have the fruit of the fig tree. We don't have the fruit of the vine. But the bramble comes along after July 18th. And it says to what, the, what, is, what is the bramble then? Is that um, it represents the messages of that? No, call. I mean bramble. The word bramble itself. Oh, what what does the word bramble itself? Yeah. Was... Okay, so the word bramble is. Uh, it's a thorn or a buckthorn. Well, okay. Uh, All right. That has to do with the thorns. It's a thorny bush, right? Okay, I got you. It right. Comes from a word that means to pierce, right, or make fast. Yeah. So, okay. so, so we know that this message of the bramble. I mean, it's it's not just about that. Colin and Odilia are making these predictions that that aren't going to come to pass, but it also has to do with the prickiness of it, right? That this is a uh, a message that is divisive. It's it's basically chokes, chokes people out. Of the yeah, message. it's attacking people, right? And it also is is a message asking people to trust in a shadow of something that's not solid, right? That's and and it's it's a call to the to the trees because these trees are the cedars of Lebanon, right? The bramble said unto the trees, if in truth you anoint me king over you, then come and put your trust in my shadow. And if not, let fire come out of 
the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. The cedars of Lebanon are the trees, right? It just doesn't tell us this till, till verse 15. And why would a cedar of Lebanon need to trust in the shadow of a bramble? Like you see the, the sort of the irony of it. Yeah. <laughs> so this message of Abimelech, we can't let this message rule over us. That is, it's based upon a false system of study and, and Christ is our king. And it's also using an authority that's not been given to it, right? Because if you think about this movement, does anyone in this movement have the authority to stop other people from listening to a message? Has that been given to any one of us? No. No. It doesn't matter, you know, if I have, I mean, in some ways you could say, well, I have my own Zoom and I can decide who I want on this Zoom. Now, that would be true if I wasn't part of this movement. If I was just doing some studies on my own and, you know, and I have an interest in, in studying something and there's somebody who's annoying and I could just say, well, look, I don't want you on my Zoom. Go away. But we're part of this movement. And, and nobody's given us that authority. Right? Right. Everybody's afraid to, to agree, disagree alike. Yeah. All we are brethren. All of us are equal. It doesn't matter that I, I, I have happened to have my own Zoom and I'm doing some studies here. Um, if we are approaching this, as a Christian and how we're studying, which we have been, um, nobody's done anything that, I mean, sure, there's situations where we uh, had disagreements, but those aren't a reason to shut somebody down, to label them a heretic, to um, misrepresent them and shut them out of the discussion, right? So this, this is the issue of the bramble, is it's, it's taking an authority that it's, is not it, it's to take. But Jotham is the message of April 5th, 2030, right? It's the message of the 70th week. And that message is to give this message to the movement. The movement needs to know that the bramble is seeking to rule over it. And that if you trust in the bramble, the cedars of Lebanon will be devoured, right? Now, one of the difficulties that we have had in this whole period of time is, what do we say and what do we do? How do we address this problem within the movement? Now, the way that I've chosen to address it is to continue to study and to allow people to make their own decisions, to invite people to these studies. But I haven't got up on Mount Gerizim yet, I don't think. I don't think that we have, right? I mean, maybe we have. Maybe there's something about that Mount Gerizim symbol that shows that that's what we have been doing by our testimony, by this study. So this message, the message of Jotham is the message. I mean, we did share it. We did share um, April 5th, 2030 in the Presidents of the United States study. I know Colin knows of it. I've sent some emails to others. And of course, people would have been sent these emails with these studies in them. Uh, so, Can we take this parable then as relating to what this movement presently is doing? I mean, to me, it seems to fit. We seem to be going over this history of what has happened in the movement. And we've also spoken to the bramble. And the bramble has this message, this critical message, is 
is asking people to trust in its shadow. But we can see that there's no substance there. Because if people are going to trust in the idea that a Sunday law is imminent, that Trump's going to become president, and that the pandemic is going to continue and be part of that Sunday law, that would be a false message, would it not? You may be correct. And so, and so this all seems to fit in how we understand um, the story of, uh, you know, as we've gone through Gideon and now to Abimelech, it all seems to fit in. And it, and it brings us right to where we are now. Now, we know that we have the story of Samson that's going to cover this same history. But remember, the story of Samson is an ironic story, right? And, and when we looked at Samson, we saw that it was much more, it, it's a much broader story than these other judges are. Correct? That's how we understood it. I believe so, yes. So Samson's going to cover this entire period from 9-11 to 2023. And so when we put these on a line, um, you know, we, we had taken this, the, the judges six, seven, and eight, and we put them on these separate lines, but we could place the story of Gideon specifically on a line dealing with July 18. But now the story of Abimelech is a dealing more, more clearly with the period after July 18, or even really we would say, from December 25th, 2021, after that period, which is when this study began, right? So the understanding of the lines began at the end of that. So we had Judges 6 represents November 9th, 2019. Judges 7 represents July 18. It's a zoom into that way, Mark. And Judges 8 represented um, a zoom into December 25th, 2021. So Judges chapter 9 begins there, right? Because that's when Colin's going to give his prophecy of Trump. And the next day, we begin our study of understanding the lines, which is, can we say that the understanding of the lines is this parable of Jotham? Because isn't what we've been doing laying out um, that history? It would seem to be correct. Okay. Yeah. So, so this to me seems to be the best way to do it. Like we struggled through different ways of looking at, at Judges chapter nine. But I would think that based upon the context of what we have, the best way to place this, at least in how we're looking at judges, is to just take it as what this movement has been doing since December 26th or 20, 25th, 2021. So we have, in a sense, this other message starting on December 25th, 2021 that has been asking this movement to trust in something that is unsubstantial. It's not based upon a correct understanding of God's word. It has, it seems to have the form of, of these structures, but those structures actually can be understood by the message of Jotham to be much more specific that they're, they're, the dates they give that they use as their evidences for the truthfulness of their message are actually witnesses to the untruthfulness of their message. Right? That's what we were able to show chronologically, that these dates were correct, but they're part of a bigger line that they're ignoring. So Abimelech being an Ill illegitimate son 
of Gideon and characterized by Ellen White as the son of a strange woman. We can see that this is a message that comes outside of uh, what this movement is about, even though it, it has an inheritance of it, that it, it has sort of usurped, really, because the rightful inheritance is the 70 sons. And that's a message specifically dealing with chronology, but more, more importantly, with an understanding of, of these symbols, how to use them correctly. And the Week of Christ study gives us that information. It points clearly that this isn't ending here in 2022 or 2023, that it's reaching to 2030. Whatever that means, it's something that's beyond what people are seeing presently, that we don't see the Sunday law at this time. <clears throat> Any thoughts on that by anybody? Because I don't think we've forced this into some kind of interpretation, have we? I don't see it being forced. But we've examined all of these options, but this is really the, the only option that fits. It is an option that fits if we are examining this with Miller's rules. Right. Because that's what we've done all through this study of Judges so far. I mean, we've been following Miller's rules. We've been looking at these verses, comparing scripture with scripture. We've looked at the symbols that have been given to us. And these symbols have given us insight into our present situation. It, it's telling us where we are. And I, I don't see it as, as being just a subjective interpretation of these. Because we've looked at we looked at these different possibilities and we can see that, you know, there probably is an echo or an application we could make to the church. So I'm not discounting that. But if we're going to take it in the context that we've done with judges, that this is 9-11 to 2023, then this definitely fits into that picture. It fits in very nicely. Because it tells us what we've already understood. Now, when, when we look at these next verses here, now, therefore, if he have done truly and sincerely, right, and made Abimelech king, so we've already dealt with that, um, then um, and then he says, well, I'll just read it again. Now, therefore, if he have done truly and sincerely in that ye have made Abimelech king, and if he de dealt well with Jer Jerubbaal, or Gideon and his house and have done unto him according to the deserving of his hands. For my father fought for you and adventured his life far and delivered you out of the hand of Midian. And you are risen up against my father's house this day and have slain his sons, threescore and ten persons upon one stone and made Abimelech, the son of his maidservant king over the men of Shechem because he is your brother. Right. So that's parenthetical. And then he says, if ye then have dealt truly and sincerely with with Jerry, Jerubbaal and with his house this day, then rejoice ye in Abimelech and let him also rejoice in you, right? So here, if we look at what's, what's put in here parenthetically, I mean, this has to in some way relate to the parable, right? But, but the one that he's referring to here is the last one, the vine. For my father fought for you and adventured his life far and delivered you. So that message has delivered us 
from the hand of Midian. That is, if we follow the message of July 18th correctly, we can be delivered from this critical spirit. But if ye are risen up against my father's house, the message of Gideon of July 18, and have slain his sons, if you're criticizing those who are still bearing this message, that have this symbol of the 70 attached to them, and killing them upon one stone. So this stone here is the stone which the builders rejected. This is the foundation stone, a tried stone, a precious stone. So they are rejecting the cross of Christ, the center of that 70th week. And you make Abimelech, the son of his maidservant, king over the men of Shechem. So here it's a maidservant, son of his maidservant. So it's uh, you know this illegitimate son, but also a servant or a slave, king over you, over the men of Shechem, because he is your brother. If ye then have dealt truly and sincerely, you know, that's fine. But if you haven't, let fire come out from Abimelech. So this is the message of July 18, right? And is the message of July 18, um, so because Gideon's message is the message, he's rejected that message of July 18. So now he's going to have this other message. There's this other message of Abimelech. And fire is going to come out of this message and devour the men of Shechem. So would we say that this fire is symbolically the fire of Nashville? That these people will be destroyed by that fire? I'm talking symbolically, not literally. Is that how we would understand that? Or should I understand it in some other way? Fire, the fire be like a test? If I have a test? Well, yes. So somehow in, in taking this message of Abimelech, this message that has happened, we've set aside the message of Nashville in some ways. I'm not saying that they have completely. I mean, because they both talk about it. But we're not we're not learning the lesson of Nashville, of what God has shown us. And, and there's a danger in accepting this message. That, that's what I would say, at least. Now, when it says, and Jotham ran away and fled and went to Beer, to the well, and dwelt there for fear of Abimelech, his brother. Um, how do we characterize this, his running away? Running away from a message, maybe a message or. Because this like message that Joseph gives, he's not going to be fighting, right? He's going to give this message and he's going to go to beer, to the well. Right. And. Okay, you had a comment there? I didn't quite if, hear. If he's that. going to the well, is he not going to back to study? Yeah, I, I would think so. Um, it's an oasis rest in the desert during the Exodus, a city west of Hebron. Um, I don't think we connected to the well of the of the oath to Beersheba. It's just it's just the well. But the translators used 2 Samuel 2014 as one of their verses to support this. Okay, so 2 Samuel 2014 says, And he went through all the tribes of Israel unto Abel and to Beth Mach, Mach Maacha, and all the Beerites. So the Beerites then are the people who come from Beer. And they went and gathered together and went also after him. Um so this is, so the significance there? Well, if we're looking at this, um, in a symbolic 
way. Second Samuel 2014, does that have a an interrelation with 2014? Um, oh, with the year 2014. Right. Yeah, I don't know. Um, the only thing here is this this chapter here in Second Samuel is the rebellion of Sheba. And Sheba, of course, is the number seven. Right? Right. Uh, and the cry, which is youthful, of course, a Benjamite. And he's going to blow a trumpet. Right. Um, and said, we have no part in David, neither have we inheritance in the son of Jesse, every man to his tent, so Israel. So, I mean, this is a pretty interesting study. Um, now, we are going to, after the book of Judges, uh, we are going to study First and Second Samuel. That's the plan. Because uh, there's lots and lots and lots in those books that um, we need to understand in putting them on a line that we haven't really done. And, and we also have the story of Ruth in there as well. So, but So I don't know if we want to come to study this right now or come back to this at some other time. But we know that Sheba would represent... Um, now... Now, it could be, so let, let's take it this way, because um, I would think that this story represents 2014. Okay, now, Beth Makah. Yeah. We know that that is the house of something. Yeah. But Makah... Is that the house of the press? The house of pressure. Okay. Yeah. So uh, Beth Makab means depression. Um, so I don't know. Like depression is in something that's pushed down or pressed. Right. But that's just the name of the place. So it's the house of pressure. But... Um, the point that I have here is because you, you mentioned 2014. And if you read this story, right, it is the rebellion that happened in 2014. Right. Right. If we're going to take this chapter, we're going to put it on a line. That's where it's going to be. Um, and, and it's a rebellion of Sheba of the seven times. That is the group uh, that, that had come into this movement that left in 2014. They came in for what reason? Wasn't it the 2520? Right. Even though Jeff was, his message wasn't really about the 2520. I mean, it's part of his message. His message was primary, primarily Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45, right? 41 to 45, yeah. Yeah. Well, 40 to 45. Okay, for, agreed. Yeah. And uh, so these people weren't really that interested in that message, the primary message of Jeff, most of the people that were coming in these movements, they were really interested in the 2520. And they're the ones that pushed the 2520 much more than Jeff was pushing. We, we, we could say that, right? For people who know that history. Right. But 2520, Jeff in 2012 said that the 2520 was a distraction doesn't mean that he didn't believe in it, but he just says it's a distraction from the main message that he was meant to give, that it had become the prominent message in the movement, which it wasn't supposed to be. It was it was a support for the message, but it was not to be what it was to become. Right? So um so this rebellion of 2014, these are the people who accepted the 2520 that then are going to be, so this is Sheba, right? The rebellion of Sheba. Um, so it's pretty interesting in that sense, but we're, we're going to have to come back to this some other time. It's nine o'clock, but um, 
I think we're starting to get a, a pretty good picture here. If he's going to go back to beer, the message of Jotham, it's going to go back to a study of the 2520, right? Yes. Okay. So. So there's. Uh, so anyway, we're going to have to come back to this. Okay, let's close with prayer. And dear Father in heaven, thank you again for your time that you've spent with us this morning and for the things that you have taught us. We pray that each of us can contemplate these things throughout this day and that when we come together again, we'll have an opportunity to share the light that we have received. I pray that you can be with each of us in our day-to-day -day struggles, in our work, in our contact with others. And we pray for this movement, Lord. We know that people are trusting in a bramble rather than in the solid messages that you have given this movement. And so we ask, Lord, that we can trust in you. Help us in ministering to others. And may your Holy Spirit go before us and dwell in us. Help us to see our need of you, to see ourselves as sinners and to confess and forsake those sins. We pray and ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.